Welcome to the Diversity Pivot Podcast. I'm your host, Julie Kratz. I am thrilled you are here with us today. Our purpose is to share stories, ideas, and tools to help you on your diversity, equity, and inclusion journey. Let's meet this week's guest. Welcome listeners. We are joined this week by Chris Clark, Dr. Clark, in fact. Uh, Chris is Director of Multicultural Student Affairs at the University of Miami, um, the Office of Multicultural Student Affairs. And he has, for the last 15 years, provided inclusive leadership expertise to organizations in the public and private sectors. His passion about issues related to belonging and skilled in the areas of organizational assessment and evaluation also recognized twice as the 40 under 40 by Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust and Le- uh, Legacy Magazine of South Florida. He has a bachelor's degree in educational studies, justice and public policy, and a master's degree with a concentration in nonprofit management, and just recently completed his doctor of education in higher ed leadership with the University of Miami. Yeah, you can't see him, but he's doing some uh, raising the roof over there. Um, and congratulations. I got to sit in on him defending his dissertation. It was just really powerful. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. And I'm doing my happy dance because, you know, it makes me so uncomfortable to hear people read about me. So <laughs> while you talk about me, I can just dance um, to kind of manage the kind of discomfort I have. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being on my dissertation. I really appreciate seeing you in the, the virtual audience. Yeah. What was it like? I mean, as a viewer, so audience, just to paint the picture, it's a big Zoom room with what I love the most is he had his friends, his family, his church, people like me, just a wonderful collection of humans. And then, you know, the other people that were grilling you, <laughs> your dissertation, <laughs> of course, but just such a supportive, inclusive environment. Um, so it was really nice to hear you defend your research. That was just really that we're going to dive into because it's really cool about his research on younger people's expectations of inclusive leadership. We're going to get there in a minute, but Chris, maybe start us off with what was the journey like to get to this dissertation and, and what was your experience like? Oh, that's a that's a great question. And again, thank you, Julie, for having me on. You know, been following your work on LinkedIn. Love your articles. Share them with my staff for professional development De- development Mondays. Spit it out. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you having me here. And um, yeah, so the journey, you know, I I I think growing up, I never thought of myself as somebody that was you know, and, and naturally smart young person. I mean, I did okay, but I wasn't really interested in school. So to find myself defending a dissertation, if somebody would have told me that as a teenager, I would have, I would have laughed and said, "Yeah, not me." Um, but I think what I found out as I as I had experiences in life as a young person, as a first gen student, as a as a uh, a student from uh, you know the urban city in Miami, um, every time I experienced something, whether it was good or not as pleasant. I always try to find ways to make it better. And I knew that there was a limitation to making it better without some form of learning. And so it just so happened as I continued to get further and further along, I always looked at, man, how could I learn more about how to solve that problem? How can I get experiences in in this this, this world that we live in? Formal education is kind of the way that to go. So, you know, after my ed, my, my my bachelor's and then my master's in corporate leadership, I said, you know, do I want to learn more about younger people um, and kind of the ways that they navigate kind of finding belonging. And I just so happened to do that at the University of Miami and study some you know Gen Z students and use my skills in inclusive leadership to make something really, really um, nice happen to learn more about how to support them. So I think learning has been something that I've been passionate about, but I learned not because I want to get a bunch of degrees and plaques on the wall, because that doesn't mean much, but about how can I make things better uh, for people that are coming behind me or people that are ahead of me? And so that's how I ended up there. And it was very much so fun, you know, and, and the worst way to defend my dissertation for two hours. But the good news is I passed. So congratulations. I I thought it was really compelling research. So we're getting, you know, we're in the throes of the pushback, the backlash, whatever you anti-woke, whatever people want to call it right now at the DEI space. And I keep urging organizations like, all right, you hit pause for now or do whatever you need to do to 
support the business and get things back on priority. You know, I'm doing my best majority group voice there, but young people are going to hold you all accountable. And if you want to be relevant to employees, to customers, the communities you hope to serve, (laughs) y'all better get with it. So your dissertation was exactly that. So it was music to my ears of the expectations that young folks have about leadership. Chris, you set out kind of, I bet, having a hunch, like, yeah, they want inclusive leadership, but like, what surprised you? Like, what did you learn doing the research? Yeah, a great, great question. I think I had known for years, I mean, if I'm doing higher ed work for 15 years, I could see the generational shift. And then you really see a shift in experiences post-COVID. And so I can anecdotally say, yeah, these students need different things. They're wired differently. But I also can see that there's a difference in our understanding of these students. And that disconnect is catastrophic. If a doctor misdiagnoses a patient because they don't understand the patient's experiences or upbringing and socialization, that's that's death. And so for us, it may not be that extreme, but these students are spending a lot of money. They're leaving their families. They are, they are high achieving. They have high rates of anxiety. They struggle to find connections. So it's almost as catastrophic if you can't understand them and support them. And so what I, I think what I found the most surprising is that um, these students, for who they are, this TikTok generation and, you know, so much of the, the social media and, and kind of individualistic people that they are, they care less about, you know, recognition, but more so care about under people understanding where they come from. And they're willing to be thought partners when it comes to how to help us better understand them, which I feel like is something that you probably would have perceived to be an approach for somebody who's doing 15 versions, 15 takes of a TikTok dance to get it perfect and seem to be, um, by technology, narcissistic. Um, The students that I talked to and worked with just once, just wanted to be understood and understood for having good intentions to valuing people. To not being not being judgmental and finding ways to to believe and be optimistic about people that are older than them, which is which is such a responsible thing for a young person. They can see things, but they can be optimistic and hope that the words that are told to them by somebody more senior to them, that they stay true to them and they give them a chance. And so that was really surprising to see in the findings about what it meant to be a part of a community, to be a thought partners and be in a in, be connected to a shared mission. And for a place like a university, a big university and young people who can be very pessimistic in theory or this cancel culture, they seem very much so interested in trying to solve problems together. That's cool. Yeah. It's refreshing when you talk to young people, Um, they pay attention to the news and politics. (laughs) They they hold organizations accountable. I mean, they're like, that's not a good company to shop with because I know what they did. You know, I was not paying attention to these things. I, I think one of the things people tell me is, well, young people always care about social issues. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> 20 years ago, I, I'd like to say I cared too, but I remember being like the planet. Like, why is everybody so worried about that? You know I mean? Honestly, yeah. I didn't think it was a big of a deal. Like you talk to young people now and they're like, oh my gosh, you're not recycling. You know, you're not doing all these extra things and they're appalled by it. Like there is, there yeah. is a real generational shift that comes with awareness. And they grew up in a time where racial issues were much more discussed than the colorblind narrative that I was falsely fed. Mm-hmm. And they're growing up amongst a high immigrant popula- population, multicultural, um, as your department, you know, serves at the university. So I'm curious, like, when people say that about young people, like, ah, they'll get you know, they'll change, they'll figure it out. They'll like, you know, have to play the corporate game. <laughs> like you're shaking your head. Why? <laughs> yeah. Cause I, I think that's a, to say that they'll change and they'll adjust. I think the flip side of that, I've been in rooms where I've seen the fortune 500 companies, the huge consultant firms, um, the organizations that would in theory not need to pay money to seek out advice on how to understand young talent to recruit, retain, and having find a sense of belonging. Yet, you know, remember my team, Ms. Kennedy Robinson, she sat in a, a huge boardroom with about 20 organizations, and I sat in the back to support her, and I started looking around, and they had these huge notepads out, and they're taking notes, and they're asking higher ed professionals, deans, folks in a, a enrollment management office and a multicultural office, 
questions about the college students that are here. And it was probably about a third question there. And I started looking around I'm like, oh, they, they are concerned that they are missing the mark when it comes to them. So that's kind of a bullish, but also an arrogant thing to say. If you say that they'll come around and you're, that statement implies to me that you don't need this young, fast, innovative talent. You don't need them to be profitable. And I'm like, great. Who's going to do the work? Who's going to be forward, forward thinking enough to actually change the world? And so I, I don't believe that. I do believe that the other version of that is these organizations are struggling to find ways to recruit and retain them because unlike previous generations, we knew we had to go and work. We had to do some of these things. We had to sacrifice so much. And not only is it better understood how to be an entrepreneur, this generation is full of minimalists. And they are willing to elope and go do things and live out and, and live minimal lives at the sake of not compromising what they believe in. Whereas previously, the carrot was the thing. We needed to be able to take care of our family. We needed a car. We needed that. That's not the case anymore. So if you don't need young talent to be profitable, then cool, do that. Good luck. But I think that there is a, a concern about the disconnect that's happening with this generation and the, and the generation's unwillingness to compromise what they believe in to get a paycheck and work for some company no. that doesn't believe in what they're doing anyway. I mean, I hear countless stories like well-educated, college-educated folks and they're not necessarily using their college degrees because they haven't found a good fit organizationally and they even have debt, you know, consider, we should consider that as a part of the factor to con- way more debt than past generations too. And they're like, "Uh uh-uh, not good for my mental health. Peace out. I'm going to go work at a cycling shop. You know, it's just like, what? I didn't even know that was an option, you know? And and so the accountability, I agree. And the unwavering commitment to diversity and inclusion. I mean, listeners, I I think the latest numbers I saw, and I know Chris, your research backs this up too. It's like 83% of Gen Z is like, we're going to check out diversity and inclusion. Like not just the representation of your leadership team, which is usually painfully low, but also what you're saying, like media mentions, like system stuff, like yeah, they're really willing to hold organizations feet to the fire in a way that previous generations did not. And then as an older millennial, I don't know what the appropriate term is for me, but as somebody that's 40 ish at the time of hearing this, you know, I just didn't know I had that kind of power. Of course I cared about these things too. I think all humans do, but I didn't have the kind of exposure to differences that these folks did. I didn't have the knowledge and awareness. I didn't have the gumption and stick to itness. I really thought I was, you know, programmed to go to corporate and do my 20, 30 years. And kids, kids, young people, not even kids, they just think very differently about their careers. They know they're going to have to work for 40 or 50 years and they don't want to do it in a miserable job or culture. And good for them. Yeah. <laughs> And and the good thing is there's other because of technology, because of access, because of their the level of kind of um of intellect, they are able to do things that can supplement um income from a job that they wouldn't otherwise mm-hmm. have. Like before, I think there's more young people now that I'm around that are entrepreneurs, that are consultants, that have their own business, they're freelance. And I remember like that was like a thing that people did when they couldn't find a job back in the day. It wasn't something that someone else did because they could make money from doing yeah, it. Yeah, you were desperate you or you were 20 years later. You thought oh, you got you your had... own, yeah. You got your <laughs> own business. Okay, got it. That means that you could not find a job. Whereas they're like, no, we, I can, but until I find something that matches who I am and what I am, I'll just freelance. I'll do yeah. something that, or to your point, I've met so many bright and intelligent um, younger graduates with phenomenal degrees from phenomenal universities that just doing minimal jobs and just having a good time. Like, so where did you go? What did you do? Yeah. And then you talk to them like, they, they blow your mind with how intelligent they are. But like, yeah, yeah, I got time. You know, I'm just a mm-hmm. barista right now, but that's cool. I'm going to do that until I, you know, I'm, I find an organization that fits what I'm looking to do. I'm like, good for you. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. You care about your well being more so than a paycheck. Hmm. What an interesting flip of the script. And, and the younger people, <clears throat> all people. Mm hmm. And it, it takes the power away, I think, from corporate, which is most concerning, is that power grab. You know, for the, the since the modern workplace was originally 
developed, you know, in the Mad Men 1950s World War II era, like it's kind of stayed the same. And Chris, I'm curious what you found in your research about how things, I mean, things have shifted. But when you think about the caregiving crisis that we're experiencing now, you think about folks with disabilities being a quarter of our population. You think about young people and this idea of flexibility is how I want to live and work simultaneously. Just all of these trends that the pandemic has really exacerbated, that makes it even more important that companies are willing to shift and pivot. But for these massive organizations, sometimes that feels like a lot. If you were to offer a few ideas, a few strategies, knowing that there's endless work to be done here, but can you think of you know strategies that work, ones that you've seen work well, or ones that you might recommend for organizations that want to do better with this? Yeah, I, I definitely can recommend you know strategies. And again, these are my thoughts and my thoughts alone. They don't represent the University of Miami. They represent Chris Clark. But yeah, I, th- I think you know the biggest injustice that you can do to people that again believe you who, who you say you are is to is to be performative. To me, I. That is a that is a fundamental philosophical no for me. If anybody knows me, they come and sits around me and we talk, and the first thing they say is, "Okay, we're going to put out a statement." I'm going to look at them and say, "Stop wasting my time," um, because I I believe I believe in symbolism, but I don't believe in empty symbolism. I don't believe in preying on the vulnerable for a moment so that we can kind of pull the chair underneath them when the the moment passes. And I feel like oftentimes. Unlike others, younger people can read organizations and people really quick. And if it's a statement, if it's if it's language that doesn't reflect accountability, if there's no actual action aligned with it and no place of transparency and collaboration, they will sniff that out quickly. And then to make it worse, if you dare try to use the talented minoritize people that are there as the tokens, you're done. You're done. And so those are things not to do, right? Like I think And they'll sniff it out, right? Like Gen Z, oh, yeah. they'll be like, that's oh, a yeah. stock photo. And Wait, I've seen that like person in all the pictures. Millennials. Yeah, millennials and like we'll we'll sniff it out too, but we'll kind of navigate it in a in a in a in a maybe a different way. Who knows? But I think those are things that companies have done to get it wrong. And the only exception I will say that I will agree to do a statement is if a statement is to provide an overview of the action that we've already determined is going to happen. So make the statement and talk about what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, how I, how you can receive updates about it happening, and other ways that you can be involved in supporting. Um, that has teeth, and I can support that. But I think organizations that actually invest time, energy, and accountability, and then they also have put mechanisms in place to measure what they say they're going to do, easy. That's an easy one because no one expects you as a company or organization navigating complex policies, culture, uh, um, other things I won't say on a podcast to solve these problems in one email. So it won't be perfect ever, but progress is the goal. You should be making progress and we should be seeing and modeling things that work. And for me, when I do this work, I ask people often, okay, that's a great idea. How you know how you know it works? And if you can't answer that question, then I'm gonna look at you. I and love say, that you, question, you, listeners. You Repeat that again. Rooting. I always <laughs> ask, I'm like that's a that sounds like a great idea, but how do you know it works? What is what is the metric that you know? So good. And if you don't know that, then you are contributing to the the problem that I kind of mentioned and before we started recording about this oversaturation of the I work. Because we well intentioned threw a bunch of against the wall and hope that it's stuck, but we had no way to understand what to throw against the wall. We didn't measure its impact. So as a result, you did things that occupied spaces for a moment, but then when it was time to look at what you did, you couldn't measure any noticeable impact. And for anybody who was on the fence, they needed to see north a little bit to be more optimistic. And if you can't give a person who's pessimistic anything north and it's a bunch of subjectivity, they're going to say this is indoctrination and they're going to retreat or they're going to go back into the space of I'm not going to put myself in environments where my privilege, my, my guilt is infringed upon for something that you can't even measure in any form or fashion. And so, you know, 
That's just my philosophy. But I do believe that measuring impact, making progress, not performative, symbolic, but symbolic with teeth and not using opportunities to tokenize people who are already taxed and stretched in um, are ways that companies really have done things. And also put your put resources where resources should be. There should not be a, a huge disproportionate gap between infrastructure for things that you deem important, like human resources and budget and finance and policies and legal. And then you got everything that exists in DEI around an advisory or a bunch of people that have to take their time out of their day to be on a committee that are not compensated for to help make decisions. No, help make recommendations that go up to people with decision making power. That that to me models busy work distraction. And that's what the last few years have felt like. I appreciate that clarity and the way you just described it, it makes me feel less challenged, although still conflicted about. Yeah, it feels like we accomplished awareness the last few years. Like to me, I don't feel like anything significantly systemically has been done other than people had to talk about it. And to your point, the people that didn't feel like it was, you know, they felt like it was performative. They could tell it wasn't really that important. They were like, "Mm -hmm, yeah, I'll go to that town hall, shake my head, do your survey. But like, I'm going to go back to the way things have always been, because guess what? That's pretty darn comfortable and it works for me. I might have to give something up to make this whole DEI thing work. And I get that. I mean, the human condition is to kind of protect the things you have. But you and I were talking, you know, as we've been talking about privilege. And, you know, I think the key moment for folks, the light bulb moment is when you think about privilege is like, not a bad thing. Doesn't mean you didn't work hard. Please don't have any shame about it just acknowledge it as a chance to be a better human and help somebody else. Like if we could just get the the folks that are so anti-DEI and anti-woke right now, just to get to that mental space. And that's going to require just so much work, I think, Chris, because we're really at a, such a frayed crossroad and you live in Florida, you know, you see it every day. It's everywhere, though. It's here in Indiana where I'm at. We're just not as savvy with our legislation. But it's 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 we're in a stark place. And I want just maybe for our listeners, if we had any words of reassurance, of, you know, I've heard all sorts of analogies, two steps forward, one step back. And I'm like, this doesn't feel like just one step back <laughs> right now. But I'm curious, yeah. what do you see, especially being surrounded by young people every day? Give us some words of hope, if you could. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, I sat on the panel last week, and they asked um, some of our student leaders talked about the concerns they had about the legislation in Florida and what it may mean for these multicultural spaces and funding, and you know what signal it was sent to those who oppose this. And you know, I, I said to the person, I said, you know, this is it is true. Like this isn't new. It's just a newer version. It's a, and what I said is, what I said about progress is real, and it's still real in this sense as well. Progress can can mean that we still can face some of these same systems with some of the same cast and characters, but it's different now because I can tell you from the time that integration happened, the things that people that came into spaces that did not have access, the things that they demanded or fought for were different. I, I talked to my mother about this when she, when, when some of the Jim Crow legislation kind of went away and she was able to integrate, she just kept her head down because she didn't want to, just didn't want to get in trouble. Her roommate, uh, you know, not her roommate, one of her hallmates, you know, in school, she had a hallmate when she went to school up in, in Tennessee. She, um, I said this, you know, she cried, her roommate cried next to the bathroom. And she thought my, she was raised to believe my mother had tail. And she felt she finally realized, like an 18, 19 year old, she was from like a rural part of Alabama, that it was all that her parents kind of raised her a certain way. It was a lot. And so, if you think about progress, right, and then this moment of legislation and some of these things, I think to say, like, for a student that maybe shares the same race and ethnicity as my mother to be dealing with some of these systems, I think you can see that the, the, the benefits of the progress that has been made because. The black female students here, they don't walk around with their head down. 
They are very much so assured of what should be. They're very much so empowered. And you know what else is different? More often than not, their peers, their non, you know, black peers understand it better. And they would never misinterpret what some form of indoctrination that happened at home would be for reality because they're more connected to it. That's so cool. even though it feels this way, right, you see in this season that even this iteration of a problem is still north and a solution than it was back then. And that's what it is. The problem is we can't be in multiple places at a time. Like it's not back to the future. So we can't parallel now versus what my mother was there. But we, those who have perspective and context, have to continue to remind every person at what point they are in the continuum so that they can do their part and so that we can continue to move north and the next person behind can, can say what their iteration of pro a problem is. I'm like, oh, really? That's your problem? You know, we had, you had a governor that tried to strip all the island. Really? Yeah. yeah. You try to take all the funding away from all the programs. And so I think that's what it is. And then I'll say this. Let me just say this because I, I don't want to forget. I try to make this work as simple as possible. And I've, we've always done this. Like we didn't focus as much on the diversity part because depending on the role that you have within this higher ed space, you don't have a role to impact diversity, um, especially for our student leaders. I'm not in admissions. I'm not in human resources. I don't hire people. But I do have a role and a responsibility to play when it comes to inclusion. And that takes nothing. And inclusion is that making sure that every single person that comes within your space or has access to you can feel like they belong here. And that's a responsibility that everybody has. And it doesn't take expert training. And I don't care how you identify, being able to say, I value a human being for how they identify to the point where I could acknowledge their existence and try to intentionally learn about how to make them feel like they are part of this space too, is not too much to ask for. And it takes away this idea that this is just so hard to do. And I think if we start there and say, you don't have to be the expert at multiculturalism. You don't have to know all the pronouns. You can value a human being that's in your space because it's the right thing to do and they can value you. And that's inclusion. Now you can always learn how to get better it depending on what interest you have but at a minimum to ask that of a person is not a lot and uh -huh. on the flip side it goes further to be seen by somebody and acknowledged in the space that is the that is a gateway into feeling like you find a sense of belonging and that's not too much to ask for anyway. no to see the human in front of you i love that as a takeaway i think that's all something that we can all do better is to fully let someone be seen let them be heard let them feel a sense of belonging and you don't have to memorize the complex history of all the different ethnicities. And like you said, mm -hmm. pronouns, if, if things are hard for you, just think about the people that are in your space and how you can make them feel included and how you know, I love the reversal of that. How do you feel like when you feel included, how could you be a part of intentionally creating a space for that? And um, just to underscore what you said earlier, Chris, I, I really love the, like, we have all these ideas in the DI space, myself included, rather than trying to do everything, pause and ask yourself, how am I going to know if that works? I just love that as a key takeaway from this episode. So listeners, that's, that's something I think we really missed. We just ran, we were so excited that everyone was excited. And so we, myself included, I was like, yes, I can do all these things. I never stopped to really ask that question of my clients. And so we're seeing the course correction now, which I think in the end will be a good thing. It's just a painful pivot point that we're at. Um, but yeah, Chris, it's been so fun to spend time with you. And I appreciate all the work you do with young people. It's just, okay. I'm counting yeah. on them. I am counting on these young people. I really am. <laughs> you and I are closer in the generational age uh, space than you may think. But, you know, they keep me young and I really do believe in supporting all people, but I spend the most time around young people. So I want to make sure that they have leaders that can be courageous enough to say, no, you don't get an out. You don't get an excuse. You get to be responsible and learn how to support people just like mm -hmm. everybody else does. And here's mm -hmm. a way. Yep. Yeah. And, so, and just to see someone like you getting their doctorate and defending their dissertation. I mean, that's just a powerful example of what's possible too. So thanks for being an inspiration uh, to all those folks I get to see on the Zoom call. It's just, uh, it's really cool to see in action. Chris, before we go, um, let our listeners know, how can they follow you, connect with you? Well, I mean, I'm on LinkedIn and you just type in Christopher Allen Clark. You can find me there. I do outside of my role in University of Miami, 
I do consulting just because everybody would they ask me over time. So I do have my own consultant arm and that's called. And he's Alex. quite good at it too. Okay. You know, I, I do it because I care, you know, if you do promo code, Julie, I'll give you a discounted rate. How about that? 10% off the con consultation fee, but it is Alan Clark and you'll see my pretty face on the homepage, but anything I, I can do to support you, um, let me know. And I really do. I really care about this work and I don't think it's going anywhere and it'll, it'll be around. We just have to be intentional about doing it. And I think we have good enough people to lead it and enough people that care about it. The future is not the other direction. Yeah, no, it's not. There's more of us than them. I am confident and, about that. And they are dying. You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean just they, they had good lives. Good life for you. I'm glad that you had a nice, long, fulfilling life. And when you layered stuff down. To we rest, have young people have that have a people very different mindset. Yes, so yes. It's inevitable. It is. It's an evolution. Well, thank you, Chris, for your time today. It's wonderful to spend it with you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. If you like what you heard, consider hiring Julie and the Next Pivot Point team to come speak at your organization's next event. We speak on a range of topics from active allyship to inclusive leadership to how to create a culture where everyone feels seen, heard, and feels a sense of belonging. Thank you for being on this journey with us. Go to nextpivotpoint.com to learn more.